Hey, well, uh, welcome into Mission Control Houston Victory Lakes Intermediate School. Uh, you're joining me uh, again, Mission Control Houston, where we're uh, controlling all the systems on board the International Space Station. And I'm joined today by Glenda Brown, who's one of our uh, EVA operations specialists. She's responsible for training the crews and making sure that everything goes smoothly. And probably one of the most exciting things that our astronauts do in that spacewalk. So it's really exciting stuff. Um, Glenda, thanks for being here. I know I'm excited to have you on. I hope they are too. Sure, and, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to all your great questions. All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? You guys can go ahead and ask your first question. Oh my, you just asked. Oh my, you just asked. Put your hand down. Thank you. Who has questions? Oh, yeah. No, whoever has questions, stand up. They're waiting for your questions. Thank you. Talk loud. Why did the president stop the space shuttle missions? Why did the president stop the space shuttle missions? Well, you know, that one is a tough one. So here's the deal. Um, president Bush um, put out a um, request for a report, got a bunch of experts together on all things having to do with NASA. So that's the interplanetary work that we do, all of the mission to Earth stuff, which is like um, the satellites that look back at the weather on Earth, um, all the programs having to do with um, uh, any of the exploration that we do, including the manned spaceflight program. And he commissioned this report to be done to see how much each thing cost and then how much benefit we get back from each of the things. And what the, re the results of that report were was that in order to do our exploration of sending people on to the stars going on to uh, the moon or Mars or an asteroid, in order to have enough money to do that, we would have to cut back on something else. They looked around at all of the cost of all of the projects, and it turns out that the space shuttle program was costing a lot of money, more and more each year because the shuttles were getting pretty old and we were having to refurbish those. So in order to come up with enough money that we could go on and do exploration, they decided to cut the space shuttle program. And in order to do that, they had to make sure we had another way to get to the International Space Station. Because we have international partners now all around the world, we could ask the Russians if they would be willing to take us to the space station. And certainly, for a certain cost, they would be able to provide that service to us. Then at the same time, we were able to turn on all the exploration money to start working on producing our own way to get back to the stars. And um, we've commissioned several uh, commercial companies to go and build uh, another vehicle that will take us back to the International Space Station and then take that same vehicle and launch it off further to the next prog uh, project that we're going to do. It's really the shuttle, you know, designed only to be in low Earth orbit, so just a yeah. few hundred miles off the Earth's surface. We want to go tens and hundreds of thousands and millions of miles away, so we need a new vehicle, and we couldn't do that while we still have the shuttle. So does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. All right, next question, guys. Is there a certain plant that can sustain life in space? Can you speak up just a little bit? I just couldn't hear that. Is there a certain type of plant that can sustain life in space? Um, well, so uh, on the International Space Station, we are already doing all kinds of uh, plant growth experiments to see what grows in zero gravity. And it turns out almost all kinds of plants will grow in zero gravity as long as they have an environment and a substrate, substrate to grow on, meaning some dirt or something that they can you can plant the seed in and then it can grow. And it just needs light and water like here on Earth, and it'll grow just fine. I know Don Pettit right now is growing quite a few plants. He's got a cucumber and a broccoli and I think some sunflowers growing on board the station right now. And uh, he's been doing a pretty funny blog where he's talking from the perspective of the cucumber as it uh, goes on as a crew member on board the International Space Station. So, yeah, quite, I mean, quite a diverse plant life can actually exist in space. All right, next question, guys. How long can a person live in space? How long can a person live in space? Okay, now I'm going to assume that you understand that you have to have an environment in space. So you have to have air around you and a pressurized environment. And as long as you have that, 
we think that you can live as long as you can here on Earth. But there, you have to take some preventative measures. You have to make sure that you're exercising. Because the, ground, the Earth isn't pulling on your system, it's not compressing your bones the way it is here on Earth. And so what we see on orbit is a loss of bone mass in the bones. Um, and we can measure that when crew members come back from space. So we've implemented an exercise program with um, a resistive exercise program that basically looks like a, a, a weight lift system on on steroids. <laughs> uh, so they put it on a little, um, I think it's a hydraulic kind of system yep. or maybe a spring kind of system that um, pushes down on the crew member on, on his uh, arms and shoulders while he's also pushing away on his feet. And that creates some uh, effective gravity. And that's what keeps their bones strong. And we're finding some great success with that. Yep. I've heard, I mean, the astronauts are exercising like two hours a day every single day of the week. So some of them are actually saying they're coming down almost stronger. Yeah, that's so, absolutely yeah. true. All right. Next question, guys. What do people do at Mission Control now that the shuttle program is no longer running? I'm sorry. What, oh, what do what, what are we doing? Mission Control now. Oh, we well, have we still have the International Space Station, which is uh, beyond world class. We'll call it a unicla uh, universe class uh, <laughs> science platform. We can do all kinds of laboratory experiments up there. Um, and in order to maintain that laboratory system, we have to maintain. Uh, the electricity coming in, so we have to ma manage all the power systems. Um, we have to provide an environment for the crew members, so we have to ma monitor the temperature and the, um, the pressure inside the vehicle, as well as the oxygen balance. You need to have a good balance of oxygen, just like here on the ground. Um, so we have to monitor all of those, and then we have to maintain all of those systems as well. So um, we keep really busy maintaining the spacesuits so that we can go outside and either take a science experiment outside, bring it back in, or maintain the system. So for example, if the big batteries um, that are powered by the solar arrays, if those were to fail, um, we would have to go outside and change out the big box that was broken. And in order to do that, we have to maintain our spacesuits and be ready at all, all times. Um, so that's what's keeping me really busy. There's a lot of maintenance that has to be done on the spacesuits to get ready, uh, as well as training all of the astronauts to be ready to do that here on the ground. So we're really busy here at uh, Johnson Space Center taking care of all those things. At the same time, all around the, the entire uh, nation, we've got uh, people that are working on planetary exploration, mission to planet Earth stuff, trying mm -hmm. to figure out how we're going to get more data about the Earth, and, um, and then planning the next um, man manned space flights um, onto uh, Mars and beyond. And in terms of just, you know, mission control here, which is where, we're, again, we're sitting right now, uh, all the men and women in this room are actually controlling the majority of the systems on board the station. It's kind of like a big remote control vehicle. So even though it's, you know, 240 miles away at any one time and traveling at 17,000 miles an hour, people at these computer systems are actually what are controlling it and kind of flying it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mission control is still manned 24-7, 365, so there's still a lot of work being done here. All right, next question. Do astronauts get sick the first time going up into space, or does this happen often? Do astronauts get sick when they go to space? Well, the answer to that is uh, yes, mostly. And, but it only happens right at the beginning. Um, have you guys studied about the vestibular system and, and how we have a little um, organ in our ears that helps keep our balance? Um, the way that works is there, uh, think of them as little hairs that are inside that your vestibular, inside your inner ear, and there's some fluid in there, and it is always uh, testing how, how straight we're standing up. Well, that fluid needs gravity to work, and when you get to space, it doesn't have that anymore. So your brain thinks that it doesn't know where you are. And just like when you're on a crazy roller coaster ride, um, and you've been up there way too long doing them over and over and over again, you start to feel sick because your vestibular system isn't working. And on the opposite side of that, I was just talking to one of the astronauts that came back from a mission not long ago, and he said that 
you know, your brain unlearns that pretty quickly. It kind of turns off those senses. And so after a few hours, um, maybe just a few minutes, you start to feel better. Maybe it takes a couple of days. But then on the other side of it, when you come back from space, your brain has to relearn that. So going for a bike ride that first day is mm-hmm. right out because you'd fall right over because your brain hasn't relearned how to balance. I've heard stories of astronauts come down and they fall asleep and they get up to maybe get a drink of water and they get out of bed and they think they're just going to float away. And then they realize, oh, I'm not floating. And they just kind of fall to the ground. So it can be a bit of an adjustment, yeah. Yeah. And that's all that microgravity that they're exposed to. So lots of fun for them, but a little difficult sometimes. Yeah, really good question. All right, next question, guys. How heavy are spacesuits on the Earth and on the moon? How much do our spacesuits wear? Way. Okay, well, I'm going to answer that in a couple of different ways. Um, let's just to give you, um, so overall, by the time you put the spacesuit on and you have the person inside and you have all of the tools that they need for their job, um, it, they weigh about 800 pounds here on the ground. So you can imagine there's no way that a person could carry that much weight around. So when we're doing training here on the ground, we'll go out to the Nutribuoyancy Laboratory so that they can float and do the work in the water just like they would be doing it in space. So that's how we create that negative weight or that neutral weight. So like you would be in space, you'd be weightless. Mm -hmm. That's how we demonstrate that in the Nutribuoyancy Laboratory. So then when you take that 800 pounds to space, we'll talk about that first, there's very, very little gravity in space. Microgravity is Mm -hmm. what we call it. And it's not enough that you really weigh anything at all. And then when you go on to the moon, the moon is a lot smaller than the Earth. It has a smaller mass. So what that means is gravity is a lot less. On the moon, it's about one-sixth that amount of Earth. So can you guys do the math in your heads real quick? What is one-sixth of 800? Is everybody doing it? Anybody know? The answer is about 133 pounds. And um, of that... Um, the crew member weighs about, we, we just average about 200 pounds. And so the spacesuit without the crew member in it would weigh 600 pounds. So on the moon, it would only weigh 100 pounds. So a person or at least two people together could pick it up. Very fascinating stuff. It's amazing, like, the, uh, the size of the objects they can move when they're up there on the space station. I mean, you can see them rotating racks that weigh hundreds or even thousands of pounds down here on Earth, mm-hmm. and they can just kind of toss them around, and it's no problem at all. Mm-hmm. Very, very good, very good question. Excellent right. questions. Next one. What type of job does a person have to have to become an astronaut? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What type of job does a person have to have before they become an astronaut? Oh, okay. Uh, Almost any kind of job. You'll want to have a good background in math and science. That is most important for, Mm -hmm. gosh, so many jobs. Um, Medical, um, science, engineering, building, and that's what we need for astronauts. They have to be able to perform the science experiments. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to run their, their systems for their, you know, all the breathing air and stuff that they need, all the power systems. So they have to understand some mechanical stuff. And then they also have to understand how to take care of each other because they don't have doctor up there. So they have to be their own doctor. So they have to understand some medical stuff too. So not, not everybody has to do every single thing. They do Mm -hmm. divide the work there. So as long as you get a good education in any one of those areas and then start to work in one of those areas for a while, then you can apply to be an astronaut. And um, they select astronauts every couple years. Uh, there's a, a many thousands of people apply, and then they, they kind of break that down. They find that the hundred or so that they think have all the right stuff, all the math, science, and, and um, uh, medical background that that they, uh, they're going to need. If, they need they, if they're short on doctors, they might take more from the medical field. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are doctors, but maybe they've done research mm-hmm. in the laboratory on uh, dr- drugs, pharmaceuticals, or something like that. Um, so that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of the background. We've even had a veterinarian before. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, we've had lots of different pilots that have come from the uh, military, and all of them have studied engineering and uh, a lot of math and science. So definitely all walks of life, but with a focus on that math and science background. Yep, math, science, and medical. So any you future astronaut hopefuls, make sure you stick with it if you 
want to be an astronaut someday, really focus on your math and science classes, especially in college and your job and things like that. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. What happens if somebody, like, goes crazy in space? Oh, I'm just having trouble hearing you. Our microphone must not be very good. One more time. What happens if somebody goes crazy? What happens, happens if somebody goes, goes crazy, crazy in up in space? Oh, okay. Um, well, you know, I suppose that's possible just like it is here on the ground. Um, but the doctors here on the ground um, go through and there's a selection process where they kind of look at the psychological background of the person, each individual person. Um, and they look at family history and then their history um, from how they've performed in their job and so on and how they handle stressful situations. They do a lot of that kind of testing. And um, um, so you're pretty much pre-selected to have a group of people that aren't mm -hmm. going to have a tendency toward uh, mental health issues. But say, for example, you did have someone, because that's possible in any in any field. Um, they also have, they have a kind of a, think of it as a medicine cabinet on board the International Space Station, and it has different kinds of drugs that can treat any different kinds of situations. So the medical officer on board, or the one that's trained most in that, mm -hmm. would talk to the surgeons on the ground, the flight surgeons, and uh, then they'd select the medication that would be applicable for the situation. But I mean, these astronauts spend almost two years together training, often in close quarters and things like that, even before they fly to the International Space Station. So by the time they get up there, it's almost like they're family already. So, I mean, you might bicker with your brothers and sisters every once in a while, but, you know, they're, they're really close by the time they get up there. Yeah, we have an excellent group of astronauts. Yes, Boy, we do. I would be uh, friends with any of them any day. And as a matter of fact, I'm friends with several of them. All right, next question, guys. How do astronauts communicate with family and friends in, while they're in space? Oh, wow, that was a great lead-in. Wow, two mm -hmm. questions that lead right into each other. Well, you know, I mentioned the flight surgeons. They talk to them um, almost every day to uh, see about their health and so on. But we also schedule family conferences. Think of it as Skyping. So they have a little video camera up on board, and then they have a two-way link, and they can talk to their families. They usually schedule those on Saturdays so that um, – you know, dads can talk to their kids or husbands can talk to their wives, wives can talk to their husbands, um, anybody can talk to their parents or wherever you get it set up. So they could talk to you if you were in their family. You just start right there on your home computer with the little com the little uh, television that's on, or the uh, little webcam. camera. Yep. Yeah, the webcam, exactly. And uh, just exactly like if you were Skyping. Have all you guys been Skyping before? If not, you should really check it out. Set up a link with your grandparents or something. It's really fun. All right, next question, guys. Somebody have a question? I'm looking around. Anybody have a question? Anybody want to ask a question? Yes. Um, I see that there was a map in the background of the world. What is that for? I'm sorry, could you ask that again? We couldn't quite hear. Uh, I saw that there was a map in the background of, of the world. What is that used for? Oh, oh you're yeah. talking about the world map. Well, we like to know where the crew is at all times. And so I don't know if you can quite see it way out there over the Pacific Ocean. You see that little, let me see. Um, yeah, there it is, way out over the Pacific Ocean. You can see where the International Space Station is right now. And those little wavy lines that are on there, that represents the track uh, on the ground where the space station is flying over. So if people out in the South Pacific were to look up in the sky right now, uh, ooh, it's after, it's after daylight, so they probably can't see it because the sun's too bright. But if you're just um, before or just after what we call the terminator, that's where it goes from the darker color to the lighter color. The sun is shining brightly off the space station, and you can see it up in the, in the early morning sky or the early evening sky. So that's where the Earth is. And then there's some other circles on there. The other circles represent um, different ground stations where we can talk to the crew from. So you see the ones over Russia? Those are all the ones where the Russian communication system can talk to the crew. And then there are some bigger, squig uh, bigger lines. There's one that kind of um, 
circles over the, the white line that goes way around uh, the United, you know, the North America, South America, all of that area, and then there's a yellow one off to the other side. Those are where um, uh, the TDRS satellite, the tracking data relay the yep. satellite, um, we bounce signals off of that. Think of it like a, um, a radio tower for your cell phone. It's the same kind of thing in space. There's a big satellite that uh, we can bounce the signals off to of, and then we can talk to the crew through that system. Yep. So just pretty much a, a tracking uh, system so we can see where the, uh, the crew and the uh, International Space Station always are. Um, all right, any more questions, guys? Questions? Uh, you said that there was a pilot that's gone in from the military into as an astronaut. <coughs> Do they have to be a pilot from the military to go be an astronaut? Do you have to be a pilot to be an astronaut if you're in the military or not? And the answer to that is no. You don't have to be a pilot. It is something that helps because, you know, the NASA is looking for the top candidate, so they want to know that you can operate complicated equipment. So that might be a plane, which is very complicated. You have to know how to follow a checklist, operate it, um, or it could be um, could be stuff in the lab. You could be working in a science lab, and um, that would show that you can work on complicated things. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a pilot, but somebody who can demonstrate that they can do complicated operations. I know a lot of our early astronauts were test pilots and things like that, but a lot of that was because, you know, the stuff they were doing, it was very new, it was very dangerous, and that's what mm -hmm. test pilots are known for doing. So a lot of your early astronauts were test pilots, and a lot of uh, astronauts, even now, still come from the military. Mm -hmm. But, you know, since the advent of shuttle and station and all the experiment work and the science and the engineering we've been doing, we now have astronauts uh, from all walks of life. So you don't have to be a test pilot. It could help, though. Now, if you're interested in going into the military, though, it really will prepare you for all kinds of things in life. So think about that. If you think that um, you might want to move on to be an astronaut or a doctor, they'll pay for your school, um, anything like that. And uh, it's a good way to serve your country mm -hmm. before you get out there and, uh, and live the rest of, of your life in whatever career you choose. You can even stay in the military. All right. Any more questions? Anybody have a question? Do you guys know when your next mission is going to be? Do you know when the next mission will be? When the next mission will be. Well, we're still doing missions to the International Space Station all the time. They're actually going to launch uh, another crew in just about two weeks from now. Um, so the International Space Station missions are going, you know, constantly. We've had people flying in space over, for over, for more than a decade continuously, you know, since the early 2000s. We call the mission that's going on right now Increment 31. It means it's the 31st group of people to stay on the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. We've been manning it continuously for 31 different crews that have come and gone from the International Space Station. So the, ne the, the next mission is Increment 32, and that's the one that Joe Acaba is going to launch uh, on a Soyuz vehicle here in just mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. So we're going to keep having lots and lots of science missions. Yep. But not an air or space? That's, that is space. They're going to the International Space Station. Oh, we're flying around in space. Mm -hmm. There's a question we can't hear. It. Can you s try to speak real loud into the microphone? Another question? Is there a certain age limit to be an astronaut? Like age limit. Like, yeah. I'm sorry. Is there an age limit to be an astronaut? Um, not, not really. Ba basically, as long as you're in you know good physical shape, you can do it. I know John Glenn famously flew on the shuttle uh, back when he was, I think he was in his late 70s, I, I believe, and they did um, something like that. I think something like that, and they did a lot of uh, testing on aging and things like that. So there's not really an age limit to it, as long as you're still, you know, in a uh, good physical condition, you can withstand the rigors of space flight. Well, I think that's about all the time we're going to have for questions today. There were some great questions, guys. I hope you enjoyed your time here in Mission Control and you were able to learn a little bit more about what we're doing here at NASA. So, again, thanks for your questions. Thank you for being here and joining me today. It was very exciting stuff. Oh, I loved it. Anytime. Just give me a call. If I can take a break out from helping the astronauts with their spacesuit stuff, I'll come right over. All right. Thanks, guys.